when you look at the composition of a steel, it's just like looking at the ingredient list on a cake. That's all it is. The heat treat is the actual baking of the cake. So if you take these exact same ingredients, you mix it, and then you bake the cake at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour, you're going to have mush. If you bake it at 700 degrees for seven hours, you're going to have ash. So you have to learn how to bake the cake right to get the desired result. It's the same thing with steel. When you look at just the name and the, those, the composition, it's just a laundry list of ingredients. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 80 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. The Knife Junkie Podcast is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, and anyone who loves knives. That's what we do here on the Sunday Weekend Show, where Bob the Knife Junkie gets a chance to uh, talk to other knife junkies. And who are you talking to today, Bob? Uh, today I'm speaking with Super Steel Steve. That's how he's known on the internet. He is a, uh, a knife reviewer, but more more like a steel reviewer and mm. and tester. He He's a, a chef by trade and profession and uses knives all the time and uh you know in his day-to-day -day life and and uh when his interest started to uh move towards uh less chef knives more towards pocket knives he got interested in the makeup of all these exotic steels that are going out there but not just the makeup of the steels themselves but the heat treat and uh so he is a founding member if you will of the of the loosely uh affiliated group the the HRC police and and really what that is, is a number of knife enthusiasts who have been testing the uh, Rockwell hardness of the steels that are coming out from major production companies, um, kind of in an interest to see whether or not these awesome exotic steels that we're paying good money for are living up to their fullest potential through heat treat and such. Right. Well, I got to talking about uh, about the HRC police, in quotes I'll say, a few weeks back on Thursday Night Knives and realized I kind of got in a little over my head. I hadn't really done much research. And uh, and that's when uh, Super Steel Steve actually got in touch with me. And I said, hey, let's not have this conversation in an email. Let's... Uh, Let's talk about it in person. Yeah. And uh, it was great to meet him. I, I, of course, met him once before on the podcast he was on, Sharp Talk. And uh, we. Uh, it, it was great to meet him there. And it was awesome to have him on this podcast. Nice of you to hold that conversation so you could educate the rest of us. Because, you know, I think as we talked about on our podcast uh, last time, you know, going down that rabbit hole of steels is not something I'm – Extremely interested in, but also definitely not educated in. So, you know, a little knowledge uh, would be nice. Yes, yes. And you said educated, I noticed. <laughs> uh, but also, Jim, uh, honestly, I'm not terrifically excited by steels that much. You know me, I'm, a, I'm an aesthete. I love the way things look and, mm. of course, how they perform. But my life has never depended on it, uh, knock on wood. So, um I'm interested in high quality steels, but I'm also happy to let other steel nerds like right. Super Steel Steve uh, get get in the weeds with it. Well, it's nice to know there are some folks uh, that like that kind of thing and uh, kind of keep the industry on their toes to make sure that uh, we're getting what we pay for, if you yeah, will. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. We're going to get into that interview with Super Steel Steve coming up next. But first, I want to remind you about G Suite. If you want to work faster and work smarter in your business, you can collaborate on files in real time, quickly find space on everybody's calendar, make and take meetings from anywhere. G Suite has the tools to boost your productivity like Calendar, Currents, Hangouts Chat, and Hangouts Meet. Also, Drive for secure file storage and sharing. Uh, docs, Sheets, which are spreadsheets, Forms, Slides, Sites, uh, even an App Maker and App Scripts. Keep, where you can organize and store ideas, even a whiteboard feature. All that is in G Suite. And they have a uh, personal as well as a business plan starting as low as $6 a month. But if you'll go to thenifejunkie.com slash G Suite, that's G-S-U-I-T-E, you'll get a free 14-day trial. And if you'll email me, jim at thenifejunkie.com, 
I'll be glad to email you a special code that'll save you 20% off your first year of G Suite. So again, go to thenifejunkie.com slash G Suite to get started. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. I'm here with Super Steel Steve. Uh, you know him from YouTube and Instagram, and uh, the formerly of the Sharp Talk podcast, Steve is part of a, a loose affiliation of knife and blade steel enthusiasts who've been conducting research uh, as of late uh, on the properties of the blade steels as they actually come to us from the manufacturers. Steve, welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Wonderful, Bob. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to have you on. You know, this. Um, I first met you uh, when you were on the Sharp Talk podcast, and and you all had me on a guest uh, on as a guest, and uh, I had a great time. You had a, a an interesting mix of people, and um, the conversation was lively the whole time, and I I appreciated that. And one one thing I got from that was that everyone had their specialties, and yours definitely seemed to be your knowledge of steels. And then recently on one of the shows I do here, um, the Thursday Night Knives show, I had Zelric Forty Two on, and we were just kind of riffing and waxing poetic, and I asked him about. What's all this about the heat treat police? And that's what that's what people have been. I, I, I don't know if it's a, if it's a condescending term or if it's just kind of shorthand, uh, but that's what people have been calling you and others who have been investigating the the properties of these deals. Uh, so anyway, um, let, let's back up and find out. You are a chef. Tell me about your your daily use of knives and and explain how this all came about. All right, my daily use of well, I'm a chef, right? So we use knives. All day long. Um, I've been working in kitchens. I've been cooking since I was about 15. I'm 33 now. And that's that's really where my love of, of knives and steel. What happened was, was really my love of sharpening. When you start working in a kitchen and you're, you're banging knives against uh, cutting boards all day, your knives get dull real quick. And one day I got really frustrated because I work in predominantly fine dining French restaurants. And things have to be real precise. And when you got a dull knife and you're trying to, you know, brunoir, like really fine dice stuff, especially, or try to cut tomatoes, um, and they crush everything, or you're trying to cut mince herbs and they turn black because your knife's dull and crushes everything, and you get yelled at a lot, I got frustrated and wanted to learn how to sharpen. So I thus then started learning how to sharpen, and then that's where it went from there. Then when I got into sharpening, I started getting into steels. That's actually what got me into folding knives. I wasn't, I've always carried a pocket knife uh, since I was a kid. Like, you know, like the typical grandpa gives you the Swiss Army knife, you know, carry the gas station knife my whole life since I was a kid. But I never really was into, because to me, folders were all like, um, like a Kershaw week, right? The assisted Walmart. I didn't know there was a, a, a world of foldings outside of that. I knew the kitchen knife worked real well, like high end Japanese cutlery and whatnot, but. Um, I had no idea there was uh, this world of folders. So in your day-to-day as a chef, uh, have you always come to work with your own sweet knife that you baby? Well, they weren't always sweet. No one... <laughs> they weren't always sweet. <laughs> they, were, they were pretty budget like anything else, you know, first. But yeah, you, you get taught that, you know, like you have your own aprons, you have your own coats, you have your own pants, and you have your own knives. You know, your knives are very – they're not – most chef's knives, 99% of not chefs that you see in the real working kitchens don't have nice knives. But they're their knives, if that makes sense. It's like, you know, they might be crappy knives, but they're their knives. You know, they, they, they have crazy recurves in them and stuff because guys hone them to death and stuff. But that they're <laughs> not, you know what I mean? So there's some sayings that they say in the, in the restaurant business that I won't say because um, I'm trying to keep my language at bay. But you, you don't really, you don't touch another guy's knives. You know what I mean? Like if you have your knives, he has his knives, and that's yours. It's kind of like, it's like driving a car or, or breaking in a pair of shoes once you get used to them, you get like in a groove. So once you find, an, you know, once you have your knife and you've been cutting with that knife for a while, you just, you know where it's going to be. On the, you see guys, you know, they close their eyes and they chop stuff. It's, you know where the knife's going to be. You know what it's going to do. You know where it's at. It becomes an extension of your hand because, you know, especially when you're first getting into cooking, you do a lot of prep cook work. Um, you know, you're spending eight or 10 hours just chopping and cut and hand yeah. work, torn it, you know, all this kind of stuff, chopping. So you, you're always spending a. You always there's always a knife in your hand, like all the time. So you got to get used to that. Yeah. So I've always had my own knives. They weren't always great. They were. You know, I started off with like standard, you know, Wally World crappy 
kissing knives and then slowly the sickness kicks in and you get better and better and better, better knives because you want to, you know, you want to go faster. You want better geometry. And, you know, so I've, yeah, I've always had probably from the time I was 18, I was when I got my first, started buying my own knives. When I was in college, I worked in an Italian kitchen for a couple of summers, you know, and I worked in pantry, you know, so I did a lot of cutting and stuff, but I was amazed, uh, like at the knife skills these guys had developed and uh, I know uh, at least the people I worked with didn't go to culinary school. Did you pick up all your knife skills on the job? Yeah, all of GT. I uh, I wanted to go to culinary school. I actually, um, but I couldn't afford it. It was <laughs> it was really expensive. Uh, so I, I ended up yeah, just school of hard knocks, just bounce from kitchen to kitchen to kitchen, learn what you can. Yeah, it's all just just repetition. So you don't want to get yelled at in French, and so you become obsessed with sharpening and having the. The sharpest knife, so that you can you can Julienne and do everything you need to do uh, with the utmost precision. So, explain to me your um, your process, how you got started with sharpening, and and what you what you've settled into as your process. Um, okay, so like for kitchen knives, it's a yeah. little bit different for kitchen knives. All right, so oh, okay. how did the kitchen knives? So I okay, so I like I said, thirty three. This is like eighteen when I started getting into it. So, well, hell. I didn't really even get onto YouTube or Instagram until the last year. So I'm, I'm like a, I'm a K, I'm a Neanderthal. Like I'm good at like dealing with fire and like dead animals. That's it. When it comes to anything tech and knives, like anything technical, I'm, I'm very, I'm not very computer savvy. Um, so, you know, I didn't know about YouTube or the internet or anything. So it was just asking guys that would, you know, not tell me to go piss off because I'm some kid asking about how to sharpen a knife. Because, you know, it's very common sense to everybody who just grab a stone. And, you know, so you go and you go buy the cheap Chinese stones at the Chinese warehouse and then you grab it and you sit there and you, and I, just like anybody else, I just, you know, I went and I learned um, from a, uh, a sushi restaurant and a guy, a buddy of mine worked there and he was like, oh, if you want to learn how to sharpen, you got to talk to you know, to the chef because he's, you know, he's sharpening these knives all day long and they're like razor blades. So I went in there and, you know, I, I, I got a gig there just washing dishes part time and I'd watch him and he just, and I saw what he was doing and then I'd go home and try to replicate it and just destroy. <laughs> just destroy. I mean, I'm talking, you're talking, I mean, I had knives that were like, yeah, I took inches off these knives just because, you know, you, you don't understand angle control and stuff. So you're just scrubbing right. and scrubbing and just peeling these knives to, to nothing, just trying to learn <laughs> how to apex. And then just, again, you know, it's just, that's why guys ask me about sharpening all the time. And I mean, it's just, like anything, you just got to do it. You know, you, you can't get scared. You know, guys are like, oh, I'm going to ruin a knife. You're never going to ruin a knife. You might scratch it, but, you know, unless it's like a collector's piece like that, you don't really want to. But if you got to use it, right. you just got to do it. Yeah, so that's how it was. I just, and then I would go and um, I would go online and look for stones and then, you know, uh, uh, try to find the ones with reviews and stuff. I didn't know about forums or anything back then, so. Mm -hmm. Just try, you know, ask, ask what the chef used. Oh, we had nano stones. I'm like, oh, they do nano stones. They do fun. I don't know, nano stones. And nobody in, right? I'm from a little town of Florida, carries them. So, so uh, how does it differ? Uh, you, you said that uh, sharpening a, a kitchen knife differs from a pocket knife. How does it differ? Is it because the steel is so much thinner? What's the. Oh, just the technique for me. Just because, okay. um, yeah, like with a, with a kit, for me, this is totally personal. A kitchen knife is much larger. So I'll usually mm -hmm. set it on over a sink or on a counter. Pocket knives used to frustrate me because they're so tiny. They have these yeah. little bitty blades. So using my club, I know I have big hands where the guy's got stubby, you know, fat fingers, Jimmy Dean sausage fingers. So trying to do this with this tiny knife used to drive me crazy. So that's when I adopted, kind of like Michael Christie does that in hand. That's when I, like, oh, I started yeah. doing that years ago because I saw an old man doing it with like a, I sort of got it was a river rock. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. So my technique for a pocket knife is usually in hand, whereas a kitchen knife is usually two-handed on a like on a table or over the sink. How long would you say from the start of uh, you know deciding that you needed to have sharp knives for your livelihood? How long did it take you to actually develop a process? And and uh, now, what would you say your skill level is with sharpening? Um, it probably took me. Because I was, I really wanted to learn. So practicing, it probably took me a solid week of just grinding at a knife to get an eighth, like get something that would resemble an edge. Um, and then from there, just paying attention, looking at constantly looking at it. So probably it took me, I'd say, a good 
month and a half, two months of sharpening every single day to get where I could, you know, get a nice paper cutting edge. So yeah, uh, but that was every, I mean, every, I would come home and sharpen, sharpen, sharpen. I would bring, right, I would right, sleep right. my stones to work in between shifts and try to sharpen them, make a big mess and then get yelled at. Okay. So now, now you're, um, now you're involved in this, uh, effort to, to kind of investigate the properties of production knife steels. I don't know how else to put it in, in the most general sense, because I'm not exactly sure the full scope of what you're doing. Tell me about Heat Treat Police. Tell me about uh, your efforts and uh, and how you got here. How I got here. So I started the channel a little over a year ago. Only because I guess I, I, I'm, like I said, I'm, I, I never really been on YouTube or anything like that. I happen to be on YouTube, and I you probably saw what I said, uh, Pete who said Nada's videos, mm -hmm. and I started looking and realizing there were these people talking about knives, and again, I had no idea that folders were anything other than like a gas station knife. So I started, I actually went on Spyderco's education, and mm -hmm. there was this laundry list of steels, and like my jaw dropped, and I'm like, oh my god, there's all these steels I have to learn how to sharpen. These are amazing, because I was just a geek, and I would geek out on it. And I can figure out how a steel can have 9% vanadium. Where I'm from in the kitchen world, it's usually very simple steels, carbon steels. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So that's how I started getting into it. Well, then I started seeing in the comments, the things other reviewers were saying and stuff, that where I come from in the kitchen knife world, most people in the high-end kitchen knife world aren't even chefs. Most of them are home cooks and home chefs. They're not pro cooks. And they almost always start by sharpening, and then they slowly get into high-end knives because they're looking for better heat treats and steels. So everyone where I come from, they all know how to sharpen real well, and they all understand heat treat, geometry, rockwell hardness, stuff like that. When I got into the folding knife world, I realized everyone was clueless. Like, they, people were talking about things. That's why my first video was with S30B, was because... I saw these, it was just, I hear it over and over again, s 30 is chippy, s 30 is chippy, s 30 is chippy. And I'm like, how, how do you say that about just a, like a, like a broad stroke, this steel is like this. You know, there's so many things that go into play. And I just thought it was cool. Yeah. And I kept seeing it, seeing it, seeing it. And then you know, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make a video and I'm going to start testing. I'm going to do a cut test as, as controlled as I can in as real world as I can. And I'm just going to video document it. So when someone starts, kind of regurgitating these things, I can kind of point them in a direction of my video and go, hey, look, this is what I found. And here's, because I'm kind of putting your money where your mouth is kind of go. So did you find, for instance, with S30V that it depends less on the steel and more on the heat treat, more on who's who's making it and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So that that's the thing. And I use this example before in my videos that really, I guess, struck a chord with everybody is when you look at the composition of the steel, it's just like looking at the ingredient list on a cake. That's all it is. The heat treat is the actual baking of the cake. So if you take these exact same ingredients, you mix it, and then you bake the cake at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour, you're going to have mush. If you bake it at 700 degrees for seven hours, you're going to have ash. So you have to learn how to bake the cake right to get the desired result. It's the same thing with steel. When you look at just the name and the, those, the composition, it's just a laundry list of ingredients. Yeah. The guy... Or, or the heat treaters, how they cook it is going to, and then how they grind it is going to determine how the knife performs. It's funny we get attached to alphanumeric con uh, combinations that that uh, for whatever reason sound good to us. Yeah, know. totally. M M three ninety. Yes, oh, thank that sounds you. Sounds amazing. And you look <laughs> thank at the you stats. all day. <laughs> yeah, you look at the stats. You're like, oh, that looks super. It's got all the stuff in it. Whereas That's you good. know. 8 CR 13, oh, it just sounds tacky. It's, <laughs> no, it's, it's so, it's so, you know, 1999. <laughs> so what was the, um, what was the impetus, or what was the, the, the one knife that made you like, hmm, I don't know, and actually got you to, to do some professional um, testing? Uh, so the test, so what happened with the testing was, so everyone, a lot of people referenced me with this whole, the HRC thing through the, the bailout, because I have a bailout video. It's got like 10,000 views, but it started way before that. What happened was I was just testing that I would sharpen the knives, same as geometry, same finish, yada, yada, cut the same stuff. And I was just documenting. And I started, when I started testing M390 and 20 CV, they all performed about the same, which happened to be cut 
almost identical to S30 and S35 that I tested. So people were going, wait, that doesn't make sense. M390 is a superior steel. And me being ignorant to how kind of ignorant everybody else was, I'm like, oh, well, it's just probably not that hard. It's probably the same hardness because the steels aren't really that different. And then there was just, everyone just was like, you, you don't know, you know, you're crazy. What are you talking about? And I'm kind of scratching my head. I'm like, well, guys, it's not just the name of the steel. You know, it's got to be hardened and it's good geometry. And they're no, 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 you, 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 you test with BS. You, you don't know what you're doing. And I'm like, mm, no. And then what ended up happening was Kurt, who's J Cool G19 on Instagram, was doing, he, he's been a machinist for like 30 years or whatever. And he had, he's a big knife guy and he had been doing, he had access to a Rockwell tester and was certified on how to use it. And he had been doing tests for LTK, love them knives. Well, then he just randomly hit me up and was like, man, I love what you're doing. If you ever want any knives tested, I'd be I'd be more than happy to do that. I've also got a PMI gun that I can test the composition. And I was like, cool, no problem. Oh, wow. And that's where it started. So I sent him a couple of knives after I did the cut test. And then lo and behold, you know, the S30B knives, the M390 knives were around the same, about almost identical hardness. And they cut relatively similar. And I wasn't crazy. Okay, so what is what does that mean then? Then what is the difference then, you know, in that case between those two blades and those two heat treats? What was the actual difference between the S thirty V and the M three ninety? What what could you point to? You got to look at a few things. So you look at we're cutting cardboard, right? So it's basically paper. So it doesn't bind up behind the edge of the knife like let's say an onion would. So okay. the biggest the biggest the biggest contributor to edge retention that you can do is your edge angle. Right, how the edge, how you know, low the angle is. So being that the edge angle was the same, and what I was cutting was the same, I could rule the geometry out, and I could, and I knew what the steel was. So the only other factor that affects uh, the edge retention after that is how hard the steel was. In a perfect world, like on a catcher test, which I only want to bring them up. But let's say you take Laren from Knife Steel Nerds. He has yeah. a, a formula that can, you can plug in numerical values and get uh, an estimated catcher test number. If you take S30V and you take M390 at the same Rockwell with the same edge geometry and the same finish, M390 will only outcut S30V by 15%, which I don't think a lot of people realize. So in a day-to-day normal guy world, you're probably not going to notice 15%. That's just so so teeny tiny. You're not even going to – it's what, a couple foot in one direction or the other. You know, if you don't hit a staple or something, you know what I mean? So yeah. So when you have the two steels at an even lower Rockwell, then the gap gets even smaller and even smaller. And even smaller. So, you know, the Rockwell C scale is logarithmic. So as it, you know, it, it starts off very slow and then as it gets harder, it shoots up dramatically. So the difference between 50 HRC and 55 HRC is not even close to the difference between 60 HRC and 65. It's much more dramatic. It, you know, so, you know what I'm saying? It's like written. Yeah. So people, I guess, just didn't really kind of understand how that worked at first. So when you, so, and so the, and the effect is less than obviously as you go back down, down that scale. So that's where this whole HRC thing started taking off and people started buzzing about it. How has this affected, if at all, how you buy knives or how you select what you're going to spend your money on? It's hard. Being somebody who sharpens, and I promote sharpening a lot, it it, it, ne- it doesn't matter to me as much because I know it, it helps me know what I'm getting into. So like stuff like M390, 20 CV, I kind of just it doesn't it's not that the steel's not going to sway me one way or the other. So what it has done with the testing though, going through so many brands and having multiple samples from each brand, it it, it gives me a better indication of kind of who's hitting the mark and who's not. Uh-huh. Um, so if I'm looking for a knife that I you know like. Again, I want like really great edge retention with, or it's a new steel. You know, like Spyderco tends to do a really good job uh, with their heat trees on their exotic steels and stuff like that. Uh, whereas someone like you know, like if I was going to go buy like a Dom from Lion Steel, mm-hmm. I'm not buying that because I think it's going to cut more than you know paper. You know what I mean? I'm not going to have any hopes or intentions just because I think the knife looks cool. You know, it's going right. to be like pocket right. jewelry. It's going to be more man jewelry. Like, oh, this looks nice, or I'm going to take it to a wedding or something. I don't expect it to be able to cut out a paper bag. Right, right, and and nothing, nothing that I'm going to do is going to challenge this M390 in any way whatsoever. Yeah, it's just like I just accept it's soft. It is what it is. I'm buying because we buy knives for multiple reasons. You know, edge retention yeah. isn't the see all end all. You know, being a user, you know, my biggest thing was, you know, and again, I never, I, 
never started this to be this, this, this boom, this villain of like calling all these people out. It's just the way, <laughs> it's just, it kind of just went that way, you know? Okay. So you mentioned Lion Steel. Let's, let's talk about some companies by name. But, uh, you know, ho- however you're comfortable with that, who do you think is uh, doing a great job? You, you mentioned Spyderco is excellent with the heat treat of their exotic steels. Who else out there do you like in terms of how they heat treat whatever it is? Benchmade does a really good job on just about everything they do. People complain about their, their S30V. They do a really good job on their M4. They do a very good job on their 154CM. They do a very good job on their S30. They do about industry standard on 20CV. It's usually mm-hmm. soft. It's usually man- Manly Knives does a phenomenal job. Uh, Manly Knives is actually a company that after we found some of their knives coming back softer after the edge retention test, we actually contacted them and through working with Kurt, Kurt actually ended up doing a lot, mailing them heat treated pieces of steel that were, they ended up finding out through that process that their diamond on the Rocco tester was broken and that their ovens were off by about 30 degrees Celsius. Oh my God. So they were like, thank you so much. They went, they had their ovens recalibrated. Um, it was actually funny because they were like, you know, we were wondering, I guess in, because in Europe, People tend to use their knives like like crowbars, and we get lots of broken knives all the time. He goes, we get them all the time, and for some reason, for that last this last couple of months, we haven't really been getting as many calls. And now we know why it was because everything was was really soft, and they were you know the knives weren't snapping, they were bending. So you know that was just an example because people I get flack sometimes people saying that I'm calling out companies. I'm trying to do bad. I'm not trying to do bad. I'm just we, the guys and me and the group are just trying to like for instance right there. It was a company that was had all the best intentions and didn't know what was happening. And then you showed yeah. it to them and they were like, thank you so much. They fixed it. Matter of fact, over the last month or so, they've been contacting people who had purchased uh, D2 knives from that batch and replacing them for free. Wow. That's good business. Super stand-up. Super stand-up. Where are they? They're out of Bulgaria? Bulgaria, yeah. They have a rep here um, in the U.S. But yeah, but they're based out of Bulgaria. Yeah. I think that it's uh, completely legitimate to – Name names sound so confrontational. I don't mean it like that, but but you know, um, you, we heard a lot about the bailout, the three V on the bailout. Which um, now, I am definitely not a steel expert. I have my, uh, I, I know what I like to as a as a total um, uh, amateur. I know I like uh, one fifty four cm. I love the way it sharpens. We talked about this on on Sharp Talk. I love the way it sharpens. I love the way it behaves, and it it seems to hold. For for my limited use, it's it's awesome. But I also, you know, like knowing that I'm getting premium steals when I'm paying, you know, premium bucks. Um, I think it's legitimate to say the three V steel on this is uh, not what it should be for that steel. For me, when I heard about that, I always thought three V was kind of a a camp knife steel or a, a high impact fixed blade steel. And uh, I was kind of shocked, not shocked, but a little bit uh, vexed as to why they would put that on a small kind of, you know, tactical pocket knife. Plastic handle knife. Yeah. It, did that seem like an odd choice to begin with? Yeah. And that's what started the whole thing is when I did the test, that's why I brought out an Emerson because they were advertising this knife. It was a marketing point. It, it was frustrating. It got me annoyed because it was every, 3V. Exactly. It's a camp knife. This is a high, it's an extremely tough knife. Has relatively high impact resistance. It's very tough. That's what it does. But it's also tough at a higher hardness. So the benefit of 3V is it's got pretty good wear resistance. It's got much better wear resistance to something like an A2 or an O2, uh, O2 steel, O1 2 steel, but much better wear resistance for beating it. Like you just said, like a fixed blade. But when I saw it and they had these, you know, on their website and there's these soldiers, you know, with the knife and they're stabbing through stuff and <laughs> telling people how, how the strength to the strength to weight ratio is through the roof on this knife. And I'm like, no, no, it's not. Like there's a million things that are going to go wrong with that knife before I even knew the steel was soft that are going to go wrong with that knife before, you know, who cares if the steel is tough, things made out of plastic. It's a, it's a yeah. bug out. It's a, just a glorified bug out. So that's where, you know, that started. And then we, I, I purchased a couple people purchased them. We sent them to Kurt and I had called it. I could show you my post on Instagram. Guys were raving. Well, I went on the, ba- the Benchmade website and under 3V, it said targeted Rockwell hardness, 55 to 58. So I can show you the post way back when, six months ago, when I was like, guys, don't get excited. It looks like they're making this stuff, you know, 
banana soft here. And then, then people started poking them and they're like, oh, it's really soft stuff. And yeah, that's, yeah, it was just, it was, it didn't make any sense to me why they would do that. So, um, well, maybe they had a bunch of leftover 3B. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just like they seem to have a lot of leftover S30. Uh, so, uh, what do you think of their, their, um, announced shift to aluminum handles and M4 steel for that night? Well, what's funny, what's funny is this, and it, it annoyed the hell out of me and the guys in my, in my HRC police group here. Um, mm-hmm. that's what they, they announced, right? They have a new version for people that want like the quote a beefier or whatever night, <laughs> aluminum handles and M4. What they really quietly said in text is, and we increase the Rockwell of the 3V version to 6062. Oh, really? Yeah, you didn't see that, did you? Because no, they didn't no, want to tell anybody. So it kind of annoyed the shit out of me. I'm sorry, it annoyed the hell out of me because I know they saw the video. I know they know what people are talking about. I know they heard the response from the community. And instead of owning and going, because they sent emails to us saying, it's to Clint specifically at Alchemy One saying, oh, by the way, no, the steel is soft because we want ease of sharpening in the field and it's not meant to be a catch all and we want it to maximize its strength, which the softness has nothing to, it's the opposite of strength. But then they turn around and just quietly increase the HRC and don't take it out. You know, they don't turn around like manly knives. Manly knives turned around and was like, hey, our bad yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. They just kind of turned around and were like, hey, we just happen to raise it. They had an opportunity to to really uh, work on their PR on their because, you know, things have not been great for <laughs> Benchmade. And uh, they had a real opportunity to sort of, hey, you know, thanks for being a part of this, you know conversation and turning it into a like a hey it's you and us and we're listening to you and we're gonna react to to me that's the way uh that's the way you could come out looking good and everyone's that, happy uh, you spoke and we answered now yeah, yeah. Still aren't we great we're great we're gonna raise it 60 62 and then you know we'll, well we'll it, it also says it also says we're not too big to care and we're not too big not to be nimble you know what i mean but and, yeah, you know. it annoyed me. It annoyed the guys in the group. You know, it, it, it's just, and I've stuck up for Benchmade for a lot of dumb things that they've done, you know, because they're an American company and I thought they, you know, meant well. But to turn yeah. around and just like slyly do that and, and just <laughs> with no explanation, not like, we just, just, so it's like, you know, like Alchemy One, he posted up on his Instagram. He's like, what about it being, I thought you wanted it soft. I thought this was intent, right? This was intentional, right? Oh, so oh, where's, yeah. where's the answer? And they just mum, you know, just crickets. So it's, I'm, I'm, you're not going to catch me picking up another benchmark for a while. I'm pretty teed off about it. Like, you know, it, it's yeah. not a, they don't got to name names or anything. Just to be to the community, hey, we're here. And we're listening. We heard what you said. We're going to work for you guys. And this is what we're doing. No, none of that. Yeah. This kind of interaction, which has made the knife world what it is today over the last 10 years or, you know, roughly whatever, since social media uh, became a, driving part of our culture i feel like that's when now there's a million different knives to choose from in every steel in every you know flavor shape you know whatever whatever you want is out there and it's primarily because nimble companies have listened to what people want and they're smart and they're like okay let's make it for them look at every chinese oem yes literally insert every single chinese manufacturer that's out there right now oh you guys like this here we go oh at what price point here you go Look at me! I have a Kirby Lambert in my hand. You know, like and they and that, and to boot, they make they the fit finish on their knives is like ridiculous for the, whatever Beautiful. price point you pick. Beautiful. You got custom makers like shaking because these guys can put out tie frame locks with like you know CNC precision for fractions of what guys can you know do themselves. I don't know if you know this about me, but I am a huge and lifelong uh, ever since 1987 or so Cold Steel fan. I love Cold Steel. So this year, well, actually, a couple of years ago, they started replacing their AUS 8A with AUS 10. Do you know anything about that and what what the difference might be? Uh, you being kind of a steel nerd. Yeah, it's uh, Cold Steel. Let me shout them out. They're a company that does a phenomenal job on each and, and a phenomenal job on grinding and a phenomenal job on factory sharpening. They do, look, I make fun of Coastal, I own Coastal Knives. I make fun of them because they do ridiculous stuff and chop things in half because it's funny. That's, yeah. I think they enjoy the, the, the laughter that comes with you don't, you, know, you don't have big old fat Lynn Thompson, you know, with 47 pistols on him shooting bows and arrows <laughs> in like a Tarzan program because you want to be serious. Um, right. but AUS 8 and AUS 10 are, are just that. They're a Japanese 
they're, they're Japanese steels, and they are you're you're talking the eight and the ten is a matter of carbon content. So AUS eight okay. is very similar to HCR, so it is about 0.8 percent uh, carbon. Uh, AUS ten has one percent carbon, so a, AUS ten is going to be more like a 440C. So it's about that level, which allows it to get a little bit harder. Their AUS eight was a phenomenal. I would buy that all day long. I mean, they, the way they do the AUS eight was phenomenal. So I have no doubt that they'll do the ten. You're, you're looking at a little bit better edge retention if it's if it's hardened a little bit more. Um, you'll get a tiny bit more carbide in it from the carbon, but it's nothing. It's not anything crazy. You know, it's not like gonna. You're not. Gonna, it, it's like a, it's like the difference between I said the S30 and the M390. You probably won't notice much of a difference. Right, unless right. they made it like you know, super hard, but it's still going to be a great steel. So explain to me how you got started in pocket knives and, and how your love of pocket knives has evolved and what your ideal pocket knife is. Uh, it was just a steel. It was like I went on that education thing okay. and I was like, there's all these steels to sharpen. And I just started picking them up, you know, like everyone does when you first get in it like a madman. And it was just like steel, steel, steel. I had one in every different steel I could, fuck, you know, I could imagine. And I'm going to pick this, 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 this. And then I was sharpening them all. And that's what that's what led into the, the, the channel was because I pick up all these steels and I'm looking at the you know what they're what I think they're gonna do and you know on the stones that some of them feel soft and then when I'm taking them to work every day, you know, and at work, you know, at the restaurant I'm getting, you know, a delivery usually four days a week. I'm getting a, a major truck delivery at least two or three times a week. So you're looking at anywhere between like forty to sixty cases. It's not a large restaurant. So, you know, these are big, thick, triple, you know, corrugated boxes. Some of them are waxed because you have wax on them because of the fruit. Mm -hmm. So I'm running a knife through a lot, a lot of cardboard, you know. So you can really quickly, within a week, not even within a couple of days, figure out if the steel is going to hold it better to that type of cutting or not. I mean, it it takes, you know, three shifts and, you know, either the knife's holding up or it's not. So that's what started me and it was just the steels and the sharpening and, you know, Ideal pocket knife? I don't know if I have like an ideal pocket knife. I don't think any of them still. Well, say you're. Uh, what are you using right now? You're in the kitchen. You're you're um, uh, three times a week. You're getting these giant shipments with this big, thick cardboard. What have you been using? I carry my Savens at work. I carry uh, usually. Well, I carry that. I carry my uh, Spyderco Caribbean a lot because it's mm. light. Because chef pants are light. So if I have, if you have a heavier, not that I care about it, like I have, I have knives for different days and purposes. You know, like on the weekend I wear jeans, so I'll carry like my Hinder XM18. Not that it's a heavy knife, but if you have these little thin, they're almost like pajama pants, chef pants. Mm-hmm. And if I have that hanging out my back pocket, it'll halfway drag my pants to the floor. You know, right? So I, right like my sure. spider, but yeah, Caribbean. It's light. It's LC200N. It can have blood and fish guts all over. I don't have to, you know, I, I mean, I think I could trash that thing. And it'll hold up through breaking a lot of boxes and zip ties and chemical containers from the dish machine and stuff like that. How do you like that uh, LC200N? It's the coolest steel since sliced bread. That stuff is... Really? Yeah, it's it sharpens amazing. It's nasty. It's not... Because it's not a normal steel, so it reacts different. And it holds an edge for... I mean, as long as... I mean, I can go... I can sharpen that thing. I can go through three truckloads with that and it'll, be, it'll still be... Break it through, and I can just hit it with a strop and bring it back like that. I've had a Spidey Chef for a few years, and I I love the knife itself, and I I don't see myself getting rid of it because to me it's like a little a little work of engineering, you know, art that I would just want to hold on to. But I've never been able to, and I'm a pretty decent sharpener just with my sharp maker and strop, and I've never been able to quite get that thing the way it should be. I feel like it should just kind of look at things and they fall they mm-hmm. fall apart. So I I haven't gotten a, a fair opinion of LC two hundred N, and it's due to my own lackluster performance uh, sharpening this stuff. If you get a chance to really go out, man, I would highly once you, once you get into this, and it's weird. It's not like the typical. You can't really talk about it like a regular steel because it's not. You know, it's, it's it's the way it's the way it's made with the electro slag and all that noise. It's it's a different thing. I, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. It, what is that? L, so LC two hundred isn't like like you have like a, like a traditional like an ingot steel, or like a carbon uh-huh. steel where it's a billet of steel, right? Uh-huh. Heat treat it, and you have like a PM steel, which is powdered steels. So they atomize them and they spray them, and then they make like millions of little tiny ingots. Uh, uh-huh. LC two hundred N is create they they forge it what's called electro slag, and it's just kind of how it sounds. It's it's in essence how do I even describe it? 
it, it's 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 a form of like electro bonding. This this steel okay. into an ingot. So it's not, and then it's like sintered. It's not uh, kind of like a PM steel. So it's not forged in a traditional way. That's the only way they can get enough nitrogen in the steel. Uh-huh. And they have to do it in like a, a nitrogen vacuum to get enough nitrogen in the steel. That's why there has to be enough chromium so it holds the nitrogen. And it's the nitrogen steels are like a whole weird space. That's why it's from NASA. It's some space age craziness. But that's why it doesn't act like a normal steel. You know, it's got like whatever it is, like a fraction of carbon in there, whatever it is, enough to just hold it together. It's basically all chromium and nitrogen in there. So maybe maybe the incantations I've been reciting aren't the right ones before I start sharpening that. I need my approach needs to change, I think. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's a <laughs> totally different steel. It is, yeah, it's just different. And when it gets sharp, it gets nasty, like like creepy, spooky, like I better not slip with this knife sharp. So have you gotten any other responses from any companies directly? Um, I saw that Hogue Knives sent Alchemy One some uh, some Hogues. I'm not sure what that was about. I, I kind of loosely follow him uh, on Instagram as well. And uh, and uh, so has anyone else responded yeah. in, in a positive or otherwise way? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of all of them. I'll say about five or six. Best Tech, I know this Steel Will did. Like I said, Manly, uh, Three Rivers Manufacturer. Actually, now that I think about it, um, I had made a post. I had got a knife in from them, a Neutron, and I could squeeze the scales. And you could watch the centering go back and forth. And it was rocking. It had bad play. And, you know, they, once I went after that with the Blade Show, I went there and I saw the guys. And the <laughs> gentleman and the woman recognized me. And when I started looking at all the new Neutrons, their, the blade grinds were thinner. You know, you could squeeze them and the blade play didn't happen. And Interesting. Because they've, they've always been known for their super thin grinds, uh, at least as far as I've That's known. That's what I've heard. Somebody like me, right? I deal with knives all the time. And dealing with my, my work knives are Japanese. So they're very, very thin. So I know what thin geometry is. So the first time I get this knife, I'm like, the hell is this thing? I'm like, is, why would you buy this off the black market? And I'm asking the guy, I'm like, this is... Because I can eyeball it, and I'm like, there's no way this thing is that thin. I actually own a Strider, an SMF. And the Strider uh-huh. and the, th- the Neutron were the same thickness behind the edge. Because <laughs> you know, when you sharpen, you know, I do everything at about a 15 degree per cent, about a 30 inclusive. So after a couple passes, once I get a burr, I can look at that edge bevel, and you can see how wide or skinny it is and get an idea. But the second I looked at it, yeah. I'm like, oh, this thing's, I wear my calipers. This thing's, you know, it's like a measure. I'm like, is it, where's my strider? I swear the bevels look the same. And I grab it and I put a, a thing on Instagram and I'm showing it cut through cardboard. And I'm like, hey, Nick, you know, I was making fun of Shabazz. I was like, oh, it's so slicey, right? It's, it's about as slicey as a brick, you know, like, look, here's my strider. That's 190,000 stick, you know? I mean, obviously that thinner blade stock, but yeah. So they, they, they didn't come right. They kind of, they didn't say anything to me, but, um, I found out from other makers that they had switched the, who was doing the hand grinding for the edge bevels mm-hmm. and such and such. And their grinds were thinner. They looked like they were probably less than 20 behind the edge. So everything was more consistent. So I'm not the bad guy. I'm just looking out for us. Hey, you know, uh, I, I think it's important. And I, I think in all realms, people should be prepared. If they're out there and they're asking you to trade your hard-earned money for their product, you know, or service, they have to be willing to take uh, some constructive criticism. It's not like you're saying, this knife sucks and moving on. You're saying, look, this is this and that, and I noticed this and that. And, you know, we are knife makers. You know, we are manufacturers of knives. What we know is making knives. And then over here you have, we are knife users. What we know is obsessing like fools over knives. So listen to us too, because... You know, we kind of know what we're talking about. I've never, again, coming from the the kitchen world, the the restaurant industry, it boggles my mind the relationship of consumer to maker and manufacturer versus the restaurant world or really any other industry I've ever seen. Like, you don't go to the car dealership and they look at you and they scoff and they tell you you can't afford the car and they put you in a jalopy POS and they have you go on your way. No, like they worship you because they're trying to sell you a car. But here in the night, in the restaurant business, people come in to serve. I have my servers trained like monkeys. Like I will cut limbs off if they don't treat my guests like guests, right? You come in, we know your name. We know what you like. We're going to, 
We're going to make you feel wonderful. Not just the food, but the whole experience, right? That's why you go to a good restaurant. But in the knife community, you have makers that just, that will take money and run. They'll, they'll cuss out customers. And you have companies that'll just mm-hmm. be like, nah, we're doing this or we don't care about this. And us as consumers are just like, like meerkats just, you know, waiting for the next sprint run to come out from Spider Co. You know, they, when they want to jack the price up $15 a year, a weird dynamic, you know, like in, in any other industry, you have to, uh, you have to sell what sells. You have to appease your customers. And here it's just like, you know, I get flack when I turn around and say the three, I get flack from my own people, like the consumers for calling out something wrong where it's like, you're looking at the wrong guy. Uh, you know? That's that brand loyalty yeah. thing. And, and also like in dealing with the knife world, you're dealing with, like artist slash craftsman slash businessmen last oftentimes, you know, oftentimes there are people who have a love for knife knives and a love for making things. And, uh, you know, the realities are, uh, the crushing realities are for business. You have to be constantly on your phone, constantly, uh, being in touch with people and communicating because especially now people, you know, my God, I texted him 10 minutes ago. Where is he? Is he dead? Does he hate me? Like, is he not making my knife? What's going on here? You know, so that's, I, I can see how that might be a hard balance. You know, being a craftsman slash artist and really having your head in your shop and in, and in the clouds in the best sort of way. And then having to deal with the realities no, of, yeah. of running a business. It, it, you know, you know? So true. And look, guys, makers, custom makers, I feel you. I am, a, I, I am a custom food maker. That's what I do. I custom make food, right? I make mid tech and custom food. So I, 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 I can, I relate. I understand I, I, to, to whatever, you know, degree being that they're different. Um, but you still have, you know, you know, it's like a, but this is what you want to do for a living, right? This is what you want. And so it's like, I have people all the time. They come up to me. They're like, Steve, you know, I love cooking. I want to be a chef. And I'm like, you love cooking? They're like, yeah. I'm like, you don't cook professionally. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, okay, you, do you want to watch yeah. all your love of cooking just evaporate? Then start cooking professionally. Yeah. Well, why? Because it's robotic and it's 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 maniacal and it's hard and it's hot and it's painful and it's it's a job. It's a career. It's a business. My job is not just to make all the beautiful food that I want to make. My job is to make the beautiful food that people want to buy. And I have to also yeah. have a customer service with that. So, you know, as a guy who kind of is in that same, like, I have a passion, oh, and I have a love, and unicorns and rainbows, I want to, you know, everybody wants to be Bobby Flay, right, we're on TV, and we're, you know, an emerald, bam, bam, but it's not like that in the real world, you know, once you start doing something professionally, like, the real world slaps you in the face, and you're like, oh, this isn't as cool as I thought it was going to be, it still is a job, I have to pay bills, you know, so they don't, I don't know, they don't get any sympathy from me, it sucks, I got scarred with approval, you know, like, (laughs) it is what it is, like, you gotta, you know, you want to make masks for a living? Then you got to deal with it. You want to make knives on the side and go with a full time job to do that. You know, I I came up in, in through art school, and it's the same thing. You 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 cannot be precious about anything. You have to be ready to hear some someone you know. rip it. Yeah, 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 and and that's what really, like you said, that's what gets you better, Steve. Uh, I I want you to tell people how they can find your uh, videos, uh, especially your videos about uh, steel testing and about steel comparisons. And then where they can find you on Instagram and all that stuff. Yeah, if you're looking for a bearded uh, drug man to rant rave about steel, um, Super Steel Steve on YouTube and on Instagram, I'm Chef Kalari. Feel free to DM me about anything. Guys are sharpening questions all the time, and I'm just trying my best to help them out. Or people want recs on, you know, recommendations on knives. Um, so that's where you can find me. I'm not on Facebook. I've never been on Facebook. I know I'm a dinosaur. Like I said, I'm a Neanderthal. Knives fire. That's what I'm good at. <laughs> hey man, that's a that's the perfect triumvirate. <laughs> I mean, if there really is a zombie apocalypse, I'll be decent. <laughs> Super Steel Steve, thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's been a pleasure. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for having me on. You know you're a knife junkie if you answer to the nickname Blade. Back on the Knife Junkie Podcast, want to remind you that uh, if you could If you like this interview and you like the Knife Junkie podcast, please give us a rating or review on whatever podcast app, podcast catcher, podcast player, whatever you like to call it, wherever you are listening. Even if you're listening on the website at thenifejunkie.com, please, it won't take very long. Just leave us a rating, review, let us know how we're doing. We'd love to hear some feedback. Bob, uh, another interview show today, Super Steel Steve. What'd you uh, come out of that interview interview with? Well, uh... 
you know, Super Steel Steve is is known for his steel knowledge. He's also known for his bluster and bravado. But I don't know. I it was great to talk to him and really meet him and 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 get the and and get the scoop on him because he's a real enthusiast, a real knife enthusiast and lover. Uh, he and I have the same favorite steel, by the way. Uh, but also, he's a real a real user, daily user of knives, and is interested not only in heat treat and steel type, but also edge geometry, grind angle, and all these other things. So he's a, I mean, he's a he's a true knife junkie, and uh, you know, I think he's a a font of information. And it was it was awesome to to talk to him and get to know him. Also, it made me feel like hmm, maybe a steel composition is kind of interesting mm-hmm. or more interesting than I gave it credit for. But uh, most yeah. definitely the whole heat treat process right. and the Rockwell uh, measuring and all of that, it, suddenly I'm interested. Well, and as you said uh, early in the intro, since he does use knives on a daily basis, being a chef, you know, it makes sense that, uh, you know, the, the knife steel needs to be what it is. The knife needs to perform yeah. as it's advertised. So, uh, yeah. yeah, he's he's the real deal. He's not just a collector. He's not an armchair warrior, you know, burning up his keyboard, talking about steels. He he knows what he's talking about. So, yeah. All right. Another uh, podcast in the books, as we say, episode number 80 of the Knife Junkie podcast. The KnifeJunkie.com is where you can find all of the podcasts. If you go to the KnifeJunkie.com slash listen, you'll find all the most recent episodes there, and you can uh, listen as far back as your heart desires. Also, please uh, subscribe to the Knife Junkie newsletter and our YouTube channel. Go to the KnifeJunkie.com slash subscribe, and you can subscribe to the podcast, the newsletter, and the YouTube channel is TheKnifeJunkie.com slash YT subscribe. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim Person, the Knife Newbie, and I want to thank you for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at ReviewThePodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.